Hey there, fellow skill monkeys. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And some people might think it might be challenging to do a fourth episode on skills, but with everybody doing their part, we're going to do an episode on skill challenges on WebDM. Today's episode is sponsored by the Wildlands Kickstarter from Dwarven Forge. Now, we've loved Dwarven Forge for a long time, used it in our videos, henchmen, even on our set. Uh, our castle is made from uh, Dwarven Forge terrain pieces. I love playing with this stuff. It's like a Lego, right? Like you can just put it together, have a good time, really easy to set up, take down, adds so much to your game, really elevates uh, the battles, no pun intended. Wildlands terrain is a massive expansion for their normal offerings. Usually it's dungeons, interior, rocky caves and the like, but now they're taking it outdoors we got mountains swamps forests all kinds of stuff they got fantastic terrain you can make ponds rivers waterfalls floating earth moats stalactites stalagmites like it's insane the number of things that they've uh, got on offering with this kickstarter this is terrain made by gamers for gamers and dwarven forge kickstarters are the best way to ensure you get the pieces you want dwarven forge makes the best terrain for your games and we love using it so if you want to get Get the lowest price for this terrain. Check out the link in the comments and description. Hey there, this is Jim and Pruitt, and we wanted to thank you for checking out Dungeon Fog. This is the top of the line tool for saving yourself hours of time while drawing awesome maps of buildings, dungeons, overland scenes, or whatever you want. And not just in fantasy, but they can do sci-fi, dystopian, and more. You can clone shared maps and edit them, and you can export all of your maps as JPEGs, PNGs, or PDFs to print them or use them with your preferred VTT. There are over 3,000 preset choices for props, filters, and textures with the option to upload and draw your own. You can choose your subscription or take an on-demand plan to fit your needs. Hey, the, they've won an any, okay? So we are in their corner. Click the link in the comments and description, check it out, and get 10% off on all annual subscriptions. All right, Jim, let's talk about these skill challenges. And mm. if so, mm -hmm. what is a skill challenge? I mean, they've obviously probably heard the those two words together in role-playing games Certainly. before. So skill challenges are a way of organizing and structuring a, a scene or multiple scenes within your D&D game, you know, providing them a kind of cohesiveness and detail that just rolling a single ability check uh, doesn't provide. They're from fourth edition. And mm -hmm. over the course of that edition, there was a lot of variation in how Dungeons and Dragons presented skill challenges. I'm most familiar with that, uh, <laughs> with the way presented in the first DMG, which, uh, if you're familiar with it, is a kind of a mess. <laughs> you know, players would have to roll initiative and, and sort of like provide justification for using their skills. And it was just very formalized. And I ultimately didn't use any of those rules and went with a more naturalistic, uh, approach that ended up being in DMG2, or close to it at least. Not that I wrote that part of DMG2, but whatever. Uh, with your mind, so, Jim. You did it with your mind. Right, with my mind, yeah. They pulled it from the idea space. Mm -hmm. And so I, skill challenges get brought up a lot in sort of the homebrew uh, community for d and I know there's a lot of videos and blog posts and the like mm -hmm. uh, on it. So it's something you might see a lot of or see referenced. I've got a surprise for you guys skill challenges are already in fifth edition and if you stick around through the video we'll kind of outline <laughs> what mm -hmm. that is and how it looks like in fifth let's look at what are the pros and cons of doing a scale challenge because mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. in my head i'm seeing what is it empire strikes back escaping from cloud mm -hmm. city and that it to me is a scale challenge it is piloting sure. it is repairing the ship there's a little social in there with luke and vader but yeah, right. I mean, that whole scene <laughs> is a skill challenge in, in effect. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 very, it has a lot of hallmarks of what makes a good skill challenge, you know, fun and engaging. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of just the basic procedure, you know, not too, not too in-depth, it's a multi-part process, something that, a task or something that actually benefits from having multiple roles and multiple participants in it. The dungeon master will set up the stakes, what the outcomes are, obstacles, complications, things like that. And then also we'll set the number of successes before three failures. And I really do recommend just three failures. If you start adding in multiple successes and multiple failures with variable DCs, it just gets really complicated very quickly. And of course the DM sets DCs and then they just, present the situation, the players respond as they would to any other kind of context within the game. Uh, the DM lets them know, okay, this is what ability check or skill proficiency, you got to roll, and then narrates the outcomes. In some procedures for it, you keep all this secret 
from the players. This is an entirely DM facing uh, you know, structure. And other times you let them know like, hey, we're, we're doing a skill challenge so that the players know kind of like what to expect and why the DM's suddenly calling for a lot of uh, you know, roles. I'd say the pros of it are that it adds a lot of detail and really lets you zoom in on these instances. And they're largely social and, and exploration focused, although not exclusively. And they give it weight. They give it the same kind of mechanical weight as, say, combat would. And just as combat isn't decided by any one thing, there's all these other factors that go into it, attack rolls and, and, and defenses of the enemy, special abilities. It, it adds that to the non-combat parts of the game. And when I think about like what really makes a social encounter or an exploration-based encounter really fun, it's that it isn't resolved with a single die roll. Mm -hmm. that there's more to it than just eh, make this persuasion check. All right, well, you rocked it, so this happens. And sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. In a similar vein, <laughs> for DMs who want to give XP for non-combat, it provides a justification for them. A lot of DMs see resolving something with one roll as not enough to justify the XP. Yeah. And so it, it kind of provides that justification for them because that structure helps DMs. It helps them run something that's engaging, that there's a lot of opportunities for the players to influence the outcome and for more participants to get in on the action. So an example would be like, I'm going to convince the NPC of something, the merchant prince, the king, the, the gang leader, whatever. You know, there's one way to handle it, which is the, you know, the charisma specialized uh, class makes their one role, you know, does really well. And that's it. We move on. Yeah. And and yet that's not how you convince someone of something in real life. Right. You very rarely do you just go like, hey, I think you should do this. Mm -hmm. OK, I will. You know, there's a back and forth. There's a time pressure. Can you convince them before they run out of patience? Mm -hmm. Can you convince them before someone else convinces them of an opposing plan? Yeah. Things like that. You know, can you draw upon their appeals to history and tradition? Can you get some dirt on them? Well, that, I, was, <laughs> I was just about to say, you know, you have your front facing character talking to them, but beforehand you could have your sneaky rogue digging up dirt on them. You can have your wizard researching the history of the situation in order mm -hmm. to best mm -hmm. apply, like kind of pressure them uh, um, as far as like how history might look at them. You know, in, yes. you know, yeah. in ages past, this similar situation happened and they weren't looked upon favorably. Do you really want to be like right. that? You know, things like that. Absolutely. Those informational weapons that you can bring to bear uh, in the final checks. Yes. And, yeah, and that's that's the reason why you add this kind of complexity to it. I mean, I'm even thinking of things like you use your gaming set proficiency to mm -hmm. play some games with that person to gain advantage on like insight or something like to to make the DM. Uh, you know, give them justification for like revealing what their flaws are, what their bonds are. Yeah. To me, it creates for a much more satisfying and immersive experience. I prefer the keep it secret from the players and just narrate and, and you know, you let them know what the individual difficulty classes and outcomes are, but not necessarily the overall structure, mm -hmm. not how many successes they need, not how long it's taking, that kind of thing. Is, is, um, there, is there not a way for the DM to, so, so to speak, change the music in the background so that they <laughs> without saying well, you're now in a skill challenge you know yeah i i <laughs> to sort of signal that this is something different yeah i would say the best way to do it is is to present it like any other ability check what's the context what um you know what's at stake you know when is it that the player decides to take an action whose outcome is uncertain and once you've done that, then you start counting up. Okay, this is how many successes we've got. Uh, you know, this is what failure means. And a big part of, of running a successful skill challenge is to convey the, the sense of failure and what's at stake without completely shutting everything down. And so that's why you introduce things like time pressure. Well, you could take all your, the time that you like, but then the other faction is gonna you know, bend the king's ear towards what they want. Keeping it secret from the players is more of a stylistic thing. I think either way ultimately works. There's some players who just hate it. And this is sort of based on my own research into the topic and looking at how people reacted to it in fourth edition, especially some of the official skill challenges that came out, that there were just a lot of players who were like, hey, this skips past a lot of stuff that we would like to interact with in an even greater amount of detail, especially mm -hmm. skill challenges related to like navigating a place or exploring a place. You know, Other players might not care for the fact that all of a sudden they have to make multiple roles to do something that up until now, a single role accomplished. And so they might just be, 
find the whole formalized process of it, the structure of it, too gamey for them. Yeah. The other danger, the other con that you run into is some players might not participate. And conversely, there are other players who, given how their characters work, will over participate or try to bend uh, what they're trying to do to fit like their best skills. You know, a lot of that's on the DM to vary things up, to, you know, to throw things to a player who's, who's not actively participating. But at the same time, like some players just don't want to participate and that needs to be okay. Uh, but it can cause friction, confusion, things like that. And the other big con that I see is it puts a lot of work on the DM. Yeah. Because what I didn't like about how skill challenges were presented early on in, in th fourth edition was the vagueness of what the DM was supposed to do. It was a lot of advice on here's the, the skills that players should be rolling, here's the order they should go in, that kind of thing. And not a lot of like, how do you come up with interesting obstacles, complications and the like that don't stall the game, that are uh, present like new context for the players to make decisions in, but still like have a narrative heft to them mm -hmm. and don't feel artificial. To me, I, I think one of the, the biggest things is to make it like compounded, like in Cypher, you know, if you have something like this, if somebody fails a check, it's gonna make the next check a little bit harder to pass. Yeah. Like, especially if they're connected. In a chase scene, in a boat, in the in Venice, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. to, go to go to Indiana Jones and Last Crusade. That's an extended skill challenge that has some combat in Absolutely. it. Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think like having a little bit of combat in a skill challenge isn't necessarily bad, if, as long as you keep it very short because you're not wanting to dive in to the whole combat structure yet, but maybe it's one attack roll that represents a more, you know, complicated set of, of circumstances or like mm -hmm. something else in a similar manner. Because one of the things that skill challenges I think do really well is that they take that abstraction of skills and what the role actually means. And by adding more depth to it, you can do a lot of, I don't know, interesting things with sort of how that skill role or ability check or whatever is interpreted, what the time interval is between these things. In a social challenge, it might be days or weeks between uh, between different roles. Then you're just like trucking through that time, moving right along, so it doesn't take up too much table time. Mm -hmm. But in the narrative sense, it takes time there. As, you know, every day the bard and the, you know, charisma-focused rogue go to beseech the merchant prince while the others are doing their work in the background to provide them the information they need and the time that it takes for someone to like change their mind and uh, get on board. The thing to do is, and this is sort of one of the one of the most common, more common complaints that I saw or criticisms of skill challenges was like one player dominating and just using the same skill over and over again with these like wacky justifications for why they're super maxed out performance is useful in every situation mm -hmm. or you know or something like that uh, and the magician <laughs> yeah the magician right like mm -hmm. uh and especially because a lot of the a lot of the time players are are hesitant to roll skills they're not hyper specialized in because they don't want that failure right, and, right. and they're afraid to sort of like contribute to it in a negative sense like oh yeah great i'm the one who failed uh and cost us one of our three uh <laughs> our three chances that's sort of part of the dm's job of like figuring out what kind of complications and obstacles might come uh, as a consequence of, of failed roles or even successful ones right like there's sometimes where a successful role is going to introduce a complication regardless you know and and it's it's up to then the next player who speaks up or the next player who participates to have to take that complication into account so situations where one character can't do everything are better examples of skill checks uh or sorry skill challenges or situations that call for simultaneous roles all of you are doing something at once so it mm -hmm. can't be one person you know doing it you know navigating terrain is like the ranger can't do all this work like the rest of you are actually hoofing it through this mosquito infested bog as well yeah you still got to keep a lookout you're still uh keeping right. an eye wizards. out for enemies <laughs> tracks things yeah. like that that guy they, yeah wizards got to make sure his spell book didn't get waterlogged and all that fun stuff mm -hmm. that's its own <laughs> acrobatics check in and of itself assuming right. they don't have a bag of holding some of the other ways that you can 
you know, add to a skill challenge would be to introduce an element of time pressure. That really helps with you sort of thinking up what kind of obstacles and complications to introduce. You know, it might be that the other groups that you're competing against or the environment that you're competing against, every time you fail, they're the source of, of conflict. They're the source of an obstacle. It gives your DM sort of a better idea of things that they can introduce that lend the skill challenge uh, weight. Basically, what you're looking to avoid are dead ends where the players just have no idea what they're supposed to do. They don't see any other avenue of, of option to approach the situation. And even on a failure, changing the context of the situation that they're in and making sure that there's a way forward is what's going to make for a very satisfying experience with skill challenges. The chase scene was a, an example I had I had written down. We did yeah. one with Sean McGovern. It was an interesting chase scene where we were chasing a guy down and like there were different ways to try to either maintain, try to gain on him, whatever. And so, you know, not everybody did the best, but but in the end it was a satisfying conclusion because it was a skill challenge that basically then ended in a form of combat but it was more about trying to stay up with this person who obviously knew the city, knew how to weave through it, yeah. throwing obstacles in the way. I mean, it's a, it's a hallmark of like action movies, right? Like yeah. you have to have at least three chase scenes a movie. Um, certainly, uh, certainly. You know, to me, the, the other one uh, is, uh, I mean, the heist. That's a skill the heist, challenge. yeah. Somebody's yeah, distracting certainly. the guard while somebody steals a key. Somebody's got to do some acrobatics to sneak into a place. Yep. Somebody's got a stealth. That's a group effort that oh, you yeah. don't, if you fail, that's the thing where it's like, well, we're trying to avoid combat. We're trying to be, avoid being seen here to, to accomplish this thing. And maybe the yeah. maybe that's the thing, the fa they fail, well, now you got to force your way in and take the thing. And now <laughs> you're known. Yeah, combat is also all, often a fail state for a, for a skill challenge. Yeah. And and like if you, the failure of this of this thing is that you will have to fight. Yeah. Like you wanted to finesse it. You wanted not to leave too much of a footprint or you wanted to escape a situation. And now, you know, you failed. You, mm -hmm. You've got to do this other thing now. And so my other tip would be to introduce a kind of uh, graduated or scaled version of, of an outcome. Instead of it being pass fail, it's things like you count up the number of failures they have and the outcome is based on the number of failures, not necessarily the number of successes. So like zero failures is the best possible outcome. You right, guys right. pull off the heist. No one knew you were there at all. Nobody was tipped off. Nobody ended up finding something you accidentally left behind. It's like you, you got away scot-free. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Whereas one or two failures, it's starting to get a little dicey. One failure, there's, there are hints. Somebody knew that you were there. Maybe they don't know it was you personally. Mm -hmm. They don't know exactly what happened. But like there's enough evidence to suggest like, oh yeah, we, we got robbed. <laughs> you know, someone, someone snuck in and, and kidnapped this person or performed their assassination, whatever, you know, the infiltration is. And then two failures is like almost a, you know, almost an entire, you know, failure itself. And maybe you, you know, you passed, you succeeded in what you were trying to do, but it's bad. There's going to be more complications later. They're right on your tail, <laughs> you know, yeah. as you book it out of there. Go back to Indiana Jones, finding the golden idol. He passed that skill challenge, but we had a couple of failures and then he had to book it out of there, getting chased the entire way. Fifth edition already has this structure yeah. in place or something very similar to it that delivers the same kind of outcome. And that's the group check. Yeah that that the, the especially as it exists in its sort of updated form in Ghost of Saltmarsh. Group checks of course are a situation where everyone uh, in the party participates. Uh, everybody rolls a check. You know, as long as half or more pass, you've passed the check. If if more than half fail, you've failed it. And as presented in the player's handbook, it's assumed that group checks are like everybody's rolling stealth everybody's rolling investigation and that's fine use that when you need to especially for stealth it makes sense or like survival but ghost of salt marsh took that basic structure and added so much to it both addressing some of the flaws in fourth edition's execution of skill challenges and like expanding on the way fifth edition does group checks yeah that i i'm like come on like why isn't this in every adventure why isn't there something like this uh presented more in the fifth edition uh books and uh, for those of you without ghosts of salt marsh what they did was um they introduced more tools for the dungeon master in this case they're talking about hazards on the ocean as you're traveling around so what ghost of salt marsh did salt marsh uh was add this sort of 
uh, fill in the details, as yeah. it were, regarding group checks. Uh, and so for one of them, it's like crew conflict. And then based on the difficulty class that you roll, it's like 10 through 20 or 25 or so. That tells you the nature of the conflict. So at the low end of the DC, it's like, eh, the, the crew's kind of grumbling. <laughs> you know, nobody's too upset, but there's some discontent here. Up to 25, which is like a full-on mutiny, right? Like you've, you've got a real problem on your hands. Yeah, yeah. And then it gives you outcomes based on what you roll. Total success, success, failure, total failure. So four different outcomes there. Then it goes ahead and takes one step further and goes, here are certain roles that the party can fulfill in this group check. But the way that these group checks work uh, in, in Ghosts of Saltmarsh is that all of you set up the scene. This is what's at stake. There's a crew mutiny. This is gonna be bad. DC's 25 for these things. Um, all right, let's roll. And once we know what the outcome is, then I'm then the DM's gonna ask like, how did we get here? Now's your chance to show us how your character, you know, either succeeded, fails, what they what they drew upon to to make their appeal to the crew. What does it mean that this is the outcome that we got? And I personally love that style of game because once I know what the outcome is, then I'm completely free to, to let my imagination run wild in terms of, of of how we got there, as opposed to before you roll. There's, I, I will, I'll always hold back because it's like, I don't really know what's going to happen. Uh -huh. I, I don't want to say too much, you know. Like I said, I, I can't quite uh, praise it highly enough in terms of how much it meets the kind of criteria that I like skill challenges for. Like it provides that structure. It's complex. You know, it, it's something that uh, engages every player at the table in a certain way. It plays to their strengths in terms of the character class the, you know, and the... And the and specializations that they've invested in um but it's also quick <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of time uh you can just make the rolls and and the dungeon master goes right this represents something that occurs over the course of days or weeks we're going to abstract time here and then afterwards what do you guys do let's fill in the details and i it's one of those things right i've created <laughs> several of my own custom ones using ghost of salt marsh as a base and uh, i'm very satisfied with how they work out um, because it's, it, it, it hits every mark that I could want it to. So taking a page from, uh, of inspiration from Adventures in Middle Earth, uh, their journeys uh, system is very, very well thought out, very satisfying to use, but it also takes up a lot of table time, you know, and you could easily have a whole session that's just getting from point A to point B, which is sort of what Adventures in Middle Earth is trying to do. Yeah. But let's say you don't necessarily want to take that much time up with it. You could split the party into in-character roles. So there's a guide who is making an intelligence nature check. You know, maybe they've studied a bunch of maps or they're familiar with the area and they're sort of planning the overall route that they would take. After the guide comes the lookout, someone that's gonna roll wisdom perception. They're the person who's, you know, keeping an eye out. They are dedicated to, <laughs> you know, to making sure nobody sneaks up on them. You know, if you're doing something else, you'd have disadvantage on your perception and that, you know, that's no good. And then the other one would be scout. This is the person who's actually going ahead of the party to see what's there. Can they find the path through the jungle? Can they navigate, uh, you know, the treacherous swamp without, you know, losing their beloved horse? Uh, whatever it is, <laughs> they're making that uh, actual survival role. Artex. And then if, Sorry. <laughs> right? And then if there's anyone else in the party, they're just making straight up constitution checks. Um, you know, the, not necessarily any proficiency related to it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how much does this tax you like physically. Yeah, how much water and, then, and food are you eating and drinking exactly. during this? Yes. Yeah. And so once you start framing it like that, it's pretty easy to figure out what the what the costs are, what the obstacles are. Like yeah. for me, total success is it took you like you made up time. You were able to find shortcuts. You were able to avoid all of the hazards. And where you thought this would take you X number of days, you actually make it through faster than you thought. Um, you know, no no penalties or anything like that. Success is like you make it through. This is the outcome we expected. There's no problems. There's no necessarily, you know, onerous complications here. But, you know, there might have been a couple of slip ups. You know, somebody fell in and you had to get them out or, or something like that. Failure would be it takes longer. Maybe it imposes a level of exhaustion. You know, there's there's some kind of penalty there. And even like hit die, right? Like it, it takes you a hit die. Give me one of them, <laughs> you know. But it could be like lost gear. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be from the character's abilities. It could be like, yeah, um, roll randomly for half the items in your pack. And, you know, those above a certain number you still have, and those below you lost somewhere along the way. Total failure could be, 
<laughs> the penalties for failure plus something else. Maybe you run into a hazard, which might trigger a second skill challenge or something like that. Maybe there's an encounter. You're blundering through this environment, mm -hmm. um, triggers a, you know, a random encounter that they're right on top of you. They've been tracking you this entire time, that kind of thing. Or you arrive at the um, wrong town. Or you arrive at the wrong town. You're <laughs> hopelessly lost. Yeah. And you've got to do the whole thing over again, which is something that can happen in the Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Mm -hmm. uh, skill, you know, group checks that they have there. Like if you've got infested food and you don't successfully pass that, um, you know, that group check, it's either going to lead to another one or you've got to like keep doing it over mm -hmm. and over. Like the fire hazard is one of those where it's like, did you not put it out? Then it's still raging. You got to do this all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Failed that constitution the, check on that infested, <laughs> infested food. Now you have dysentery. Right. So. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Everybody's poisoned. The last thing I'd say about uh, skill challenges, group checks, which is the role that magic, special abilities, items, things like that play. And it was always ambiguous in fourth edition how this would work out. Some players don't like it. Some players are like, no, I want to roll my skill. I want my moment to shine. I don't want the wizard to take care of this again. It's worth thinking how much should magic influence these roles? Should it just give you advantage? Should it negate a role entirely? Where it's just like, all right, check off that success. You spent like your highest level spell slot, <laughs> you know, to deal with this problem. Then yeah, that's worth an automatic success. You know, if it's something that you could use repeatedly over and over and over again, maybe it's just advantage or, or something like that. But figuring out how you want magic and the class's special abilities to play in is gonna be pretty important, especially in fifth edition where there's a lot of magic, a lot of supernatural abilities flying around. Um, you don't wanna like restrict it to just skills because that feels artificial and yeah. like, and prevents those primary spellcasting classes from you know, contributing with what they do best. But you also don't wanna necessarily present a situation in which one spell can completely negate the challenge. And that's why these are complex, multi-step, simultaneous things that need a lot of interaction to, uh, to really make them shine. Sometimes the players have an ability or a spell or a way of even just describing something that you as a DM should, can just go like, well, that makes sense to me. That's an automatic success. Right. And any of the other things that we've talked about in this series about ways in which automatic successes can be generated, ways in which the players can describe things and interact with the fiction of the world that completely negates the need for an ability check. All that applies to group checks as well. And um, it, it, to me, it creates such a satisfying experience that a single role just doesn't cover. It's never going to get that uh, not get that close. Yeah, the only example I, I can think of that would be a, lo a really fun skill challenge was you're in the hold of a ship on sea and you either yeah. run aground on an, like a reef or it's combat and you get rammed and now you're in a sinking ship. How do you get out of that before it sinks? Like, oh yeah, the, the ticking clock of the water rising, you know, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's athletics checks or acrobatics checks. Maybe it's uh, something else to, maybe you want to try to open the hole even further and swim out. Do yeah. other things start swimming in from the ocean? You know, like mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. what kind of detriment do you want to add to this? And uh, yeah. just like trying to navigate a ship, like maybe the lights go out and now you're backwards. So you have to orient yourself properly. It tips on its side, and you now, yeah. the, and now yeah. the doors are all on the ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> and now you're running on the walls. Um, yes. So you know, however you want to vary that up, but that is a good example of a of a skill challenge uh, and a way to just kind of scare your players without just like, you know, here's a dragon. You know. Yeah. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I guess I just look at the camera the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm used to. Yeah. <laughs>